they look like deer. But be warned, they're the furthest thing from the peaceful herbivores you're used to. They're called simply not deer. These creatures might look like deformed or mutated deer. They might seem to be deer, but behave aggressively, intelligently, or even malevolently. Some might even appear to be something else wearing the skin of a deer to disguise itself. What it truly is, we may never know. But what we do know is they're terrifying. Enjoy these allegedly true scary stories about sightings of not deer. By the way, one of these stories is definitely from an older episode, and a few others seemed really familiar, so I apologize if I accidentally re-narrated some older stuff. Remember to send me your scary stories at darkstories.org, and be sure to follow Freaky Folklore on Spotify to help us make it to 100,000 Spotify followers before New Year's. The comment of the day comes from a previous episode titled, Wrong Turn Horror Stories. This was posted by Fear Street, who says, I took a wrong turn into my mom's bedroom one night as a kid. Scariest horror story of my life. My reply? I picked this comment because it brought back a childhood memory of mine of when I walked in on my parents taking a pit stop into Squishy Town. The only way I could react back then was walking away and laughing all the way back to my room. I'm still coping with it to this very day. Leave a comment in today's episode and I might reply to it in one of the next ones if I find it interesting. Now, let's begin. There's something out there that only looks like deer. From Creeped Out. I used to live in a small southern town. The town parts were pretty run down and badly maintained, but the forests and running trails and parks were stunning. I moved out at the age of 18 once I'd graduated, and I had enough money and savings to get an apartment. Luckily for me, there was room at an apartment complex that was only 10 minutes of a walk from my favorite park. This park was my favorite because it had a long, winding running trail looping around it. After moving out and settling into my new apartment, I made it a habit of waking up at 6am, two hours before I needed to be at work, and spending at least an hour at that running trail. Morning runs got me ready for the day and made my coffee afterward taste much better. One Tuesday morning, I went running as I would have any other workday. It was a bit colder than usual, but nothing I couldn't handle. Half of this trail takes me through a wooded area with a few disc golf posts that no one ever used. For a few minutes, you'd find yourself surrounded by trees with no visibility of the road next to the park, nor the rest of the park itself. Anyway, a few minutes into my walk that day, I made it to this section of the trail. I rounded one of the bends and stopped. Straight ahead of me was a buck. The sight of it startled me, but looking at how odd the thing appeared to be took my breath away. Its legs appeared broken or malformed in some way, as if they had too many joints and were too long or too short. The buck's entire body trembled as it breathed in, and the face was all messed up. Deer aren't supposed to have forward-facing eyes like a predator. But I kid you not, this deer's eyes set right at the front where its forehead was. Its mouth hung open as it breathed, raspily. Its teeth were a hue between brown and yellow, and they were sharper than I thought a deer's teeth would be. I turned right around and began to jog away, pretending I hadn't seen it. But it knew... I soon heard the clumsy clomping of hooves on concrete behind me. I nearly screamed. I glanced back and saw it half walking, half running towards me. The way its four legs scuttered in no way resembled a deer. It lacked all grace and normalcy. It looked as if its legs would snap in half at any moment. Seeing this, I ran full speed out of the trail. When I made it to the road and away from the woods, I looked back. There was no deer in sight. I ran on back home hoping that I'd just imagined it, but obviously that was just me trying to deal with the intense dread I felt. I have no idea what it was. 
It certainly wasn't a normal deer. Maybe it was a buck with some sort of birth defect that had managed to survive this long. Maybe it was an extremely diseased animal. Still, both of these excuses don't seem to explain it. These days, I stay on the half of the trail that doesn't cut through the woods. That's not a deer. From Kelly Fox. This happened in winter of 2019. It was late, probably around 1 a.m. My best friend at the time, Stevie, realized she was out of smokes, and we don't smoke the same kind, so she convinced me to go out. It was freezing that night, the kind of night where there's no wind, but the chill in the air is so cold, you can feel it in your bones. As my late Nana would say, it's raw outside, which I always thought described that kind of cold well. We hurried to my van and got in quickly. It didn't take long. The store is only down the road, so we were only gone for like 10 minutes anyway. When we drove into my uncovered driveway, the headlights of my van lit up the piece of my backyard you can see through the mesh fence and into the right side of the yard, which goes back a ways, hits another mesh fence, and then goes into a small clearing and a tree line that leads into some woods. Basically, the entire right side of the yard was lit up from the headlights. We didn't get out of the car right away. That was just our routine, to smoke a cigarette while the van is still warm before going in. But it didn't take long for Stevie to point out that we were not alone. After I lit my cigarette, I handed her the lighter and she asked, What's that deer doing in your yard? Why is it just standing there? Is there something wrong with it? I suddenly didn't feel the warmth of the van anymore, and my heart skipped a beat. I looked over into the yard, and standing in my headlights was the outline of what looked to be a deer at first. I didn't take my eyes off of it, but I grabbed Stevie's arm and said, That's not a deer. Get in the back and stay down. I must have sounded serious but she did what I said without hesitation. I looked at the figure, which for the most part looked just like a deer, but the longer I looked, the more I knew something was wrong. The flesh looked necrotic and was falling off, skin sliding off as it stood there, like it was rotting right before my eyes. The antlers were small, but they were covered in what looked to be blood, and as I finally got to look at its face, it had a set of blue eyes that looked human. It had a mouth with lips, and I swear it was smiling. It was smiling like it saw an old friend. I was frozen with fear for a moment, like time slowed down once I realized it seemed to know me. I was only able to start moving because the thing began to mouth words. I noped the heck out of there and climbed into the back seat with Stevie. When I got back there, she started to open her mouth, but I gave her the shh signal, so she stopped. After about 10 minutes of complete silence, I decided to take a look, which I wish I hadn't, or I wish I'd waited longer, because when I looked, it was trying to climb over the fence. It now had human legs, arms with hooves, and a half deer face. The deer skin had seemed to have fallen off completely by now, and it revealed new human-looking skin. Before I was able to duck down, it must have sensed me, because it looked back and we locked eyes one last time. It was still smiling, so I went back to hiding. We probably waited almost two hours before we even looked up, and when we did, that thing was gone, and I was able to turn off the van completely. When we got back inside, Stevie wanted to know what the heck happened. So I told her a story from when I was a kid. My story of my first encounter with that thing. Needless to say, her jaw dropped. She wanted to know so much more, but I told her talking about them is said to give them power. But she went off searching on her own, which is something else I advised against. But of course she didn't listen. 
We never really talked about it too much after that, and I lost touch with Stevie and moved April 2020. Since then, I haven't had anything like this happen again. I have dear friends, but they're real dear this time. It may or may not have been the same entity, but the way it looked at me I'll never forget. I pray I don't run into it, or another one like it, again. But considering I live by even more woods, it may just happen. And if it does, I'll let you know. They weren't dear. From Davy Cannon Hound. In my city, there is a relatively large nature center, large enough to hold a small herd of deer. One day, I was out there taking a walk. I'm a big nature lover, and I sometimes go there to relax. The nature center generally closes at seven at the latest, and this was in the middle of the summer, so the sun was usually out fairly late. On the way out, I heard a noise, a noise I'd never heard before. It was some sort of cry, high-pitched and warbled. It wavered a little as well, making it worse. Now, generally, I don't get truly scared. It's easy to startle me, sure, but it's hard to actually make me scared. This cry, however, woke up whatever primal instinct is left in us humans. The first thought I had was, I need to get the heck out of here. The second thought was, wait, why? I looked back behind me towards the deeper part of the nature center, where I'd heard it. Of course, I didn't see anything, and I didn't hear anything else. Afterwards, I quickly walked out of the nature center, not wanting to stay in the wooded area any longer. A few days later, I was talking to a friend about what had happened. At first, I don't think he believed me, but there must have been some look in my eyes or something, because he began trying to think of what I could have heard. Screech owls can make some weird noises, and so can raccoons. But it wasn't either of those. While those were creepy, they sounded nothing like what I heard. Eventually, we decided we want to check out the nature center at night. My friend got one of his friends together, and we managed to get inside. Flashlights and knives in hand, we began walking along the trails. Fairly early on, we saw five or six deer to one side of us. Not bothered, we continued on deeper. After walking more, we heard something walking on the leaves on the ground. Shining our lights through the trees, we saw deer again around the same number from earlier. We guessed that it was the same herd from before. We decided to stop in place for a bit to listen for any weird sounds. The deer never moved on, which was odd, and whenever we shined our lights in their area, we could still see their reflective eyes staring back at us. Eventually, we decided to call it and started to head out when we heard noise from the other side of the path and discovered there was another herd of deer. We found it odd. The nature center was a decent size, but certainly not large enough to hold that many deer. Regardless, we continued. As we went on, we realized the deer were keeping pace with us, as if they were following us. We stopped, and we watched both herds. I'm not sure what my friend saw, but the deer I was watching were not behaving right. They were moving their heads up and down from normal height to down where I felt their legs should be. Occasionally, one of them would take a step or two forward, bobbing its head like a dove or pigeon would. We soon decided we needed to leave and proceeded to head to the exit. The quote-unquote deer continued to follow us at a relaxed pace, as if to constantly remind us of their presence. After exiting and driving away, we discussed what had happened. We all agreed that those things weren't deer, but questioned what else they could be, as the nature center was not large enough for anything but a lone coyote. Getting on Google Maps, 
I discovered that the nature center actually connects to the woods surrounding the Natchez Trace Parkway through a thin strip of wooded area. Something could travel from the Natchez Trace Woods to the nature center no problem. After that incident, I haven't been back. Creek Crosser from Marin. This story I know for sure is from an older episode, but I remember it being a pretty good one. Enjoy. Growing up on a small, mostly self-sustained chicken farm, my family had many animals. We would have anywhere from 50 to 200 chickens on the farm our Alaskan Malamute, a barn cat, and a few other more exotic animals as well. Mostly birds, skunks, or young foxes that I would find in the woods and bring home to nurse back to health. My childhood was full of animals, and considering the chickens would be slaughtered about every two or three years for meat and sale, I was used to seeing death at a young age. A few times our Malamute got loose, and he would attack many of the chickens. Or that's what we thought. I never actually saw him go at more than one single chicken. The most I saw was the roosters, who we raised for the county fair shows, taunting him, walking into his chained area and pecking him in the face, and running just out of his reach. Honestly, I never blamed the big guy for defending himself when he could. But on three occasions, I had come home from school to see my father piling dead chickens on top of one another. Loads of them. And none of them had been attacked in quite the same way that the Malamute did. He would simply snap the neck, but whatever was doing this to the chickens, it left quite the gruesome scene. The animals sometimes tore almost in two. Not to mention the different breeds were taken care of in different ways. The white-laying hens, who were rather plump and rarely came off their nests, would be missing their heads. The thinner, long-legged Polish, the chickens with the fluffy-looking feathers on their heads, were often nearly completely plucked of their silky plumes. These ones specifically were rarely ever eviscerated, while the rest were. I often helped pick up the dead birds. We slaughtered many for ourselves, and this didn't bother me too much. I never questioned as a young child why our dog would take so many birds like that. As a farm kid, I was told that wolves were bad, and because Malamutes tend to have a large percentage of wolf genetics, it was just his animal DNA kicking in at times. But I didn't believe that, and I could tell that my parents were grasping at straws. It was only in high school while doing reports for the science teacher. He would have us track various animal sightings throughout the state, and one of them was for deer. I learned a lot of seemingly useless information about deer that month. Their lifespans, mating patterns, size, weight, diet, the whole kebab. But this was when I began to notice that some pieces of the puzzle began to fall together. Almost every time our chickens were unceremoniously slaughtered was just before hunting season. A few weeks afterward, my father would come home boasting that he saw a large deer out in the woods. He boasted that one day he would have that sucker mounted in the house. I knew exactly what deer he was talking about, one that we nicknamed Oscar. When you've been hearing talk of that large deer in the woods for almost 15 years, and you know that white-tailed deer live for about four and a half years, you begin to get a little skeptical. Anyway, my first encounter with an animal that I actually feared, I was with my childhood best friend. We were about nine years old, and I wanted to show off the property I'd grown up on. My father had large deep trails wide enough for his tractor throughout the woods. It was a large square 30-acre lot. We had a path following the perimeter of the property, and another crisscrossing the square in half from both directions. There were many other trails as well, those pine woods were alive with life, and I'd often followed game trails, sometimes nearly 50 acres into the neighbor's property. We walked up behind the barn on the north side of the property, following the main trail to the back of what we owned. I'd read a book which was published on the farm about 20 years before my own family moved in. 
I was telling her about the property and the previous owners. The two of us were nerds, and this kind of information was our bread and butter. Now, usually, I cut the walk in half, walking through one of the crisscrossed sections because, frankly, I'm lazy. But I'm also very proud of my home. I had a slew of new information, so we kept walking on this occasion. The sun was getting farther behind us. We had gotten off the school bus about half an hour before, so we were pretty far in. Now, I've encountered this Oscar before, and knowing this, my mother had warned us not to walk too far into the woods. It was rut season, and the bucks may get territorial. Obviously, we didn't listen. Turning with the square-shaped paths, we began to walk south. That's when I spotted one of my favorite game trails. I ushered my friend towards it. I was walking just in front of her then, and she bumped into me. I'd gone quiet for the first time in close to an hour, because I spotted it. A massive deer standing before us. My friend steps out from behind me, confused, then gazes past me at the deer as well. We're both awestruck, silent. We're taking in every detail. The deer was on the main trail. The game trail we followed cut off the southeast corner of the property. But this image of the deer that was before us, it wasn't right. Imagine a deer. Copy and paste it into a document and scale it up three times its original size. The antlers alone could be either side of the trees blocking us from the creature. I remember the dull thud they made when it bumped them against the trees, as of telling us, you're lucky the trees are in the way. We stood entirely still before we began running, and I'm ashamed to admit that I felt a need to outrun my best friend. Something primal in me, I guess. We made it back, winded, exhausted, and terrified but also excited to see a deer so big. We told my parents we'd seen Oscar the deer, not once imagining the possible outcome to our fate. Maybe it was our childish mind seeing what looked like a deer, but I was soon beginning to believe that Oscar was something else. About a week after this, my father took me hunting. Up I go into a tree stand, holding onto a thick pine, much like the one Oscar had tapped with his horns. This day was cold and foggy. It was a school day, but I was allowed to stay home, and it was also the only year I'd ever go hunting. As I sat in that stand, mostly trying not to fall asleep, I began to turn to look around, eventually scoping out the back side of the tree. Some distance behind me across the path, I saw a large deer. I was excited, ready to tell my father that I spotted something, but I quickly fell quiet. The deer had looked up at me, looked directly at me even from that distance, even with the fog. I felt like I was staring point blank into its face as well. But the typical glossy black eyes of a deer were not the eyes that I met, and I was soon wishing to go back home. I started to complain to my father. I made up every excuse to go home and escape, and finally he relented. On one condition, I was to go walk with him up toward the southeast side to look for deer on foot. The sky seemed to crack apart as we descended the ladder. Rain was falling now through the trees around us, the fog mostly dissipating in the warm shower. I went eastward while he went south of our position. I ended up nearly at the top of the hill, the one I don't like to go near due to my fear of heights. There was a thicket bush there. It was partly stamped down already, and curious. I poked my head inside and found a young fawn. It was maybe a few days old. I didn't want to disturb it in fear of its mother maybe abandoning it, so I rose up. And as I did, I found myself staring directly at a doe, its mother. She was snorting and stomping in agitation, and instead of charging or trying to push me away, she instead stopped. Her ears went on high alert, then she simply crawled into the thicket, hiding with her fawn. Then I heard the sound of a branch snapping, a branch, not a stick on the ground. 
It sounded like it had come from somewhere behind me. I walked forward slowly. I could see my father's fluorescent orange cap in the distance. I was stiff as a board when I finally got near him. These woods were beginning to turn sinister. Thankfully, my father was giving up on the day because of the rain and didn't ask me any questions. Apparently, he assumed I was just cold, and that's why I was shaking like a leaf. Later that day, after returning home, my father would come back home after going out again, saying that he saw Oscar walking across the street toward the nearby river. Only at that section, it was more like a sandy creek. That was behind our neighbor's house, and oddly enough, to make things worse, the sweet older widow who lived there that I often visited with to birdwatch turned up dead of a heart attack later that same week. Right after her passing, all the sightings of Oscar the deer had died down for nearly 10 more years. Within that time, I began to forget about the weird happenings in the forest and on our property. I had made a friend from across the world who I would video chat with often, and using my phone, I decided one day I'd take a walk with my dog so that I could record the property for her. As I left the house, I went out the back door to show off the large open lawn. I walk across the path, which cuts into the middle of the woods, and I go deeper. As I get near the back end, my dog begins to walk closer to me. I keep going in, despite my dog obviously getting a bit scared which was completely unlike him. Soon, it began to rain, so I decided to turn back toward the house. I didn't want my new phone to get wet. It was my only source of communication with my new foreign friend. I began to slow down about halfway back, and that's when I began to hear branches breaking behind me. I turn just so I can show my friend what the sound was. I turn the camera back to the trail and there's a small oak tree fallen on the path about 50 yards in front of me. A tree that had not been lying there before. Nor did I hear it fall and make a sound. Again, all I had heard were branches snapping. So this was quite strange. I look at my dog, who was happily panting now, probably excited to get back home. With that, I decide I'm just being paranoid. I continue to walk back when I suddenly hear a high-pitched pitiful screech from the direction of our home. If you've ever heard a rabbit scream, it's horrifying. At first, I didn't know what it was and I began to run towards it. As I get to the house, I find my rabbit dead. He's still warm though, but there are no footprints in the soft earth, though there should have been. Every part of me was screaming not to stay outside. So I grabbed my perished friend, and I took him inside, only to get him a fleece blanket to wrap him in. I bury him, but I made sure to keep my dog inside while I did. When I was done, I stood up tall. I was on the edge of the woods near the base of our large evergreen pine tree. My eyes were locked in the trees nearby. I then threw the shovel to the ground and shouted at the top of my lungs, that this was my home, and whatever was doing this was not welcome. At that point in time, the farm was running low on chickens. All that was really left was a Muscovy duck who was nearly seven years old. I can say honestly, he's still alive somehow. My parents were forced to join the workforce, so it was quieter around here anymore. More sad. I grabbed the shovel and turned, from this view of the farm, the barn is to my right. There is a large red shed in front of me, just off to the right as well. A white shed blocks out most of the view of the red one, and the house is to my left. The road was in my sight, and many trees were sheltered in the large yard toward the west side, standing in the road, hidden partially by some tree branches. I saw a deer who was the same size and even the same shape as Oscar. It was facing towards me, watching me. I held my ground, still angry at what it did to my rabbit. It must have lost interest because it looked away from me and it began to cross the road. But as it did, I finally got a good look at the thing. 
the creature was massive, but its body was torn, bones showing, and its head was more skull than flesh. I forgot to breathe as I looked at it. When it was gone out of sight, I struggled to breathe again. I went inside, not even feeling safe in my own home. The next day, I would take my dog for a walk, trying to calm down. I was approaching the river that ran parallel to the road, and as I did, the dog began to freak out. I looked up, and down the hill from us, there it stood, knee-deep in the river. I didn't react out of fear. My dog couldn't either. I scooped him up, all twenty pounds of him, and I began to quietly walk back the way we came. By the time I get over a large hill in the road, he calms down, and I'm able to set him down again. I wonder to myself why that thing keeps crossing the road, why it keeps letting itself be seen, but often just barely. I haven't seen it in some time, and I moved out after a while. Maybe it's waiting, maybe it's done with our land, because everything there is dead, I don't know. But that creature made our property a living hell.